kind of deal with the data lake issues and kind of figure out how well we can get uh, things up together. And uh, Dr. Winslow's comment was really trying to get all the telemetry data, also import it, but only data in sort of the central data warehouse. So you can do uh, a lot of these analysis. Does this clip work? So I want to actually talk about deep learning at Google. So the medical brain team at Google uh, is a team that basically does machine learning uh, research at Google. In particular, it started around 2011. And it focuses on using very large data sets that requires a large amount of computation to really push the boundaries of what's possible. And I uh, may have alluded to some of that earlier. So sort of uh, on a very quick overview, we used to write rules that are on the left side, and many, many folks uh, still do where, for example, on the Gmail spam filter, we'll talk about uh, specific rules that, that look at things like that contain Viagra or whatever it is, and we use those rules in order to filter out spam. The new way, we basically train a classifier. We tag a bunch of images and say, a, a bunch of emails and say, these are clearly not spam. These are spam and see where it goes. So deep learning is basically a class of machine learning algorithm that's actually quite old. It started in the 80s and the 70s, but at the time, it was very difficult to computationally actually use. And in the last 10 years or so, it started uh, being really possible for you to actually train these networks. But there are actually basically groups of very, very simple networks that are grouped together in various different ways in order to do some uh, fairly surprising calculations. So for example, you can a very basic uh, classifier. You can train whether something is a cat or a dog on a neural network. So uh, the computer science community basically started this challenge called the ImageNet competition. Uh, this is from Feifei at Stanford, who is now actually also at Google, uh, where they manually tagged uh, around 100,000 images, actually more, but in this challenge, they used around 100,000 images. And they tagged uh, around 1,000 labels of uh, very specificity on each image. And these are some of the examples of the labels. And you can see, basically, in 2011, the performance of these algorithms uh, pre-neural network are actually already quite good. Right? The error rate is 25.8%. But that's you know, significantly hundreds of orders of magnitude better than blind guessing, uh, which is, would be in the order of 0.00 something percent. But in this case, it's, the error rate is uh, high, but still pretty significantly uh, non-guessing. And then in 2012, you started seeing the emergence of neural networks, and the error rates very, very start, uh, quickly started dropping. In fact, in 2014, uh, you see, for example, uh, one of the organizers actually grabbed a bunch of graduate students to see what the human error rate would be, and the human error rate is around 5.1%. And you can see that since then, the uh, model's error rates have been below what the human error rates are. So we actually knew that internally at Google in around 2014. So we've, at that point, stopped optimizing for accuracy. And one of the things that we wanted to see was, can we start optimizing for the ability to run these networks? So we started trying to decrease the number of parameters these networks actually contain, and you can see on the parameter side that these numbers are starting to go down. Because what we really wanted to do was, uh, can we enable these neural networks to run on things like portable devices? So the Inception v3 model, which a lot of the medical research community actually currently uses, uh, can actually be run at around 5 to 10 frames a second on a cell phone processor. So really enabling high accuracy as well as the ability to run these in a much more portable way. So these are some examples of some of the uh, classifications that is possible. So you can go down to essentially species level. You can go down to fairly granular level. And when it does make mistakes, it actually does make somewhat of sense that these mistakes are being made. So what is happening at Google now that we know this is working? So we are applying it almost every arena across Google. Uh, these are some of the examples of live products that are currently using our deep learning networks. So for example, in Google Photos right now, you can actually uh, put in put in any word that you want. For example, a statue, or in this case, Yoda. Uh, it will it will find those images that it thinks have those concepts in them without you having to tag them a priori. Uh, we have things like object detection. These are actually things that happen right now in Google Cars when they drive around, and take photos. Uh, we don't just take the photos themselves. We actually go and analyze the photos, and, uh, and we take pictures of. We try to isolate, for example, the stores. If we can see the hours of operation, we try to pull that information out. Um, and these are examples of instant segmentation. This is somewhat health-related. We can do things like patient uh, person post detection, uh, speech recognition. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about translation, because I think this goes to some of the things that was mentioned earlier by May. So right now, deep learning is very uh, popular for, for or very well known for needing a lot of training data. And that is definitely true. 
Uh, in the last five years, we spent a lot of effort trying to figure out if we don't have a lot of training data, is there any way we can still train these neural networks so that they have high accuracy? So uh, this is an example of us training an English model and training a Portuguese model. And you can see the error rate is actually pretty high because we don't have a lot of examples of the Portuguese model. But what we started to notice is that you can do this thing called transfer learning that really significantly improves deep neural networks. And this is a lot of the work, uh, some of the work in health that I'll talk about in a little bit. But basically what you do is you use one network that you know is similar uh, to train basically the structure of the network. And then you bring the entire structure over and just train the weights. And we see that in translation. Actually, Google now talk as uh, Google's translate model now publicly uses this model where we train all language pairs at the same time. And uh, we have a blog entry which talks about it. And uh, it significantly improves all language pair translation all at once. And it also makes it possible, frankly, for us to translate hundreds of language pairs. Because otherwise, the combinatorial uh, number of pairs of languages makes it basically impossible to do. Uh, we, have, uh, we did well in this Go competition. I can't talk too much about it because I still have no idea how to play Go. Uh, we started off a uh, thing called Smart Reply, which was originally a joke, which is, uh, can we train a deep neural network to predict what your responses will be in email? Uh, in 2015, we actually launched a product. You can actually now see it in Gmail, uh, where we suggest not short snippets of replies for you based on your previous email uh, replies. It turns out I could, uh, a lot of my replies can be automated, which is quite sad. Uh, the animation here doesn't work, but we've started to combine, essentially, multiple modalities of these uh, algorithms. For example, to do combined vision and translation, you can take out the Translate app on your phone, and it will automatically OCR and figure out how to do Translate. Uh, some of the more advanced stuff we've been working on are things like image caption research. Can we automatically write a sentence about a picture? It turns out we can generally write it pretty well, but there are still some examples where we miss. For example, if you look on the lower right, uh, that actually has been fixed since. Uh, but to May's point, I think one of the big challenges on deep neural network was really interpretability. So we spent a lot of effort really trying to understand, can we interpret these models? So we started to build things, essentially, uh, that are now called attention models, where we're able to build another neural network that are essentially somewhat adversarial that sits on top of the first neural network that tries to figure out what the first neural network is paying attention to. So these are actually examples where the neural networks are making errors. And you can see the white spot where we are asking the second neural network to figure out where these errors are being made. So for example, it, looked, it saw a giraffe as a bird and things like that. And it actually allows us to basically figure out how to improve these algorithms. Uh, May talked about unstructured data. We spent a lot of work working on unstructured data. Uh, this is an example of us really uh, understanding. So the top uh, portions of it are paragraphs of text. And the bottom portions are actually questions being asked of the model. So these are not ex verbatim in any way. So it's being asked, some entity identified a deceased sailor as X who left behind a wife. Can the, can the algorithm tell me what X was? And it turns out that we can do that pretty well. And the red was basically what the uh, algorithm both paid attention to and decided what the answer was. Um, I think there was some mention of ICU. We are spending a lot of effort doing IoT, really trying to link up. Uh, not just on the industrial side, but of course on the health side. Uh, this is an example of what we've done internally. So on our data centers, we of course have lots and lots of sensors, and we spend a lot of time tuning different power requirements that happens in our data centers. So we actually have that done pretty well already. But what we wanted to know was, was it possible to one, predict what our power usage is, and then figure out how do you tune that even better than what we've already spent 15 years of very smart engineers do. Uh, do. One is, we, apparently, we can. So this is an example of a deep neural network really predicting in real time what is happening to our power usage. And then we ask the deep neural network a second one to basically go and build a much better control algorithm to figure out how do you actually tune these power usages even better. And you can see an example of us uh, turning this machine learning control on and off. And this is now happening in all, all of Google's data centers. It's kind of weird because now our data centers run themselves, uh, but it works pretty well. So what happens when we try to apply a lot of technology in healthcare? Uh, there's a lot more stuff coming out that is not yet public, and I won't mention it. But I'll mention some of the things that are public. So it turns out Google has been in health for a very long time. One in Google, uh, one in 20 searches are actually health-related. These are some of the sample searches that happen. And we spent a long time building machine learning algorithms to figure out how do you directly extract snippets of text from web pages to directly answer a question that you might have. So in this case, what is a colonoscopy? We have an NLP-type algorithm with deep learning that figures out 
uh, there are this web page that can answer that question. This is a snippet of text that's related to it. We're very interested in public health in general. We have a lot of products that talk about health. Uh, this is an example of birth control. Let me jump ahead a little bit and talk about one of the papers that we recently published on medical imaging, uh, which is the diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy. So basically, the classification problem is you have a number of retinal images, and you're interested in grading them in terms of a scale of five for no diabetic retinopathy to having proliferative di uh, diabetic retinopathy, which is essentially you can think of it as a grading scale from one to five. So it turns out that, as many of, uh, of the faculty here have men already mentioned, uh, ophthalmologists are not particularly consistent about how they grade these images. Uh, there's a lot of variability when you look across uh, how ophthalmologists grade the same image. And it turns out that even uh, when the same radar grades the same image over the course of weeks, that rating changes. So what we wanted to do was we overread the images significantly. We took a, a large image data bank and we asked uh, up to seven to 10 ophthalmologists to really look at each image and took the consensus imaging. And we want to see whether the deep neural network can really go and predict the consensus imaging. This is actually all just based on the uh, Inception v3 model that I talked about earlier. So this is a model that we trained out of YouTube. This allows us uh, to build a pre-structure on basically teach the computer how you look at an image. And then we took that and trained it on the ophthalmology images themselves. This is Inception v3 that I'll talk about later, but it's essentially completely open source. And it turns out the deep neural network can do very well. Uh, deep neural network, in fact, can do better than any ophthalmologist in the uh, individual ophthalmologist in our study. So uh, there are two big challenges that happen here that I will hand wave a little bit because the papers are coming out. So one is, of course, very few institutions can afford to go and have 100,000 images go read by 10 ophthalmologists each. Uh, so one of the things that we also noticed, one of the things that we focused a lot on was really reducing the number of reads and training samples you really need in order to do these studies. So we have a lot of effort in really trying to figure out how do you bootstrap these studies so that you can start much faster. The other thing that I can talk about is uh, how do you then deal with, you know, to Dr. Lane's example earlier, when you have a disease as a sensory syndrome where it's unclear how many diseases it actually is, how do you deal with that? So we, of course, have a lot of data on YouTube, and we wanted to see can we train a model uh, that is completely independent of labels? So having no labels at all, what would happen? So basically, we built another deep neural network that are based on a fake classifier originally to go and see what the deep neural network would pick up. And we looked into the first layer of the deep neural network to see what features they would pick up. And you can see that basically when we inspect the model, when we inspect the embedding on the first layer, it actually has features that are somewhat human interpretable. So example, this is what happens when you reverse compute one of the, uh, one of the nodes. You can see that it basically has something that looks like a face that triggers that particular neuron. And of course, since we're training on YouTube data, it has something of a face for cats. Uh, which is also able, uh, we're able to pick up. So I'm going to rush through some of this because uh, I think I'm standing between you and lunch. Uh, there are many ways you can actually use deep learning already. Uh, there are, we have a number of cloud API that allows folks to see where our research is and to use them live. For example, this is a Google lang uh, natural language API. This is all live products where we will automatically go pick up entities. We'll understand some of the sentiments of the text and we have text and text analysis. We are adapting some of this for health. So you can imagine really going through an unstructured node and picking up all the entities that are health related. Uh, we have a Cloud Vision API where, to the earlier point, we can also tell you sort of generally what's in this photo, what the probability value is, if there are faces that we detect, what the emotion on that face is, the text that we detect, uh, what language it is, and what the translation might be. And on the Cloud Video side, really starting to look at you know, things like uh, label detection, face detection, et cetera. You could, of course, pre-train your own model. I mentioned earlier that uh, we basically release a lot of this. We're very supportive of what's happening in the uh, general research and education community, given especially what this conference is about. So we have released uh, TensorFlow, as you guys probably know, uh, completely open source. We've even released the models that we've trained in many cases. So Inception v3 has been recently, for example, at Stanford, used to bootstrap a dermatology deep neural network that is also better than dermatologists. We weren't involved in that work, but they use basically TensorFlow and Inception v3 in order to start that network. Um, and if you want to play around with it, you can play around on the site, uh, playground.tensorflow.org. But uh, I want to briefly talk about two things, which is, of course, 
given the, the caliber of people here, probably many folks are interested in developing their own machine learning uh, models instead of simply using out of the kit, out of the box solutions. So we have both the ability to do that on our systems, which have specialized hardware. Uh, we've literally designed new processor, tensor processing units, and it'll do these models that will literally uh, go from you running a model for a month to several minutes. So you can go and train it there, or you can run it on your own GPU, CPUs, as Dr. Lane has also alluded to. And one of the things that we've really started doing is we know that there's a lot of interest in deep learning. Uh, we know that there is not as much expertise out there. So we started to run our own education program in this space. So we have a program called a Google Brain Residency Program, which is a one-year program where we bring folks in. Uh, every year, we run 30 to 50 folks, uh, where we basically work with them to conduct deep learning research, uh, both on Google problems and non-Google problems. Uh, basically, I think anyone in this room can, can apply. Uh, the program actually just, uh, the program application timeline just passed. But the next cycle will start in, in January of 2018. In addition, as you uh, probably guessed, I have a significant interest in healthcare. So we've started a parallel program for uh, essentially medical trainees. So we have uh, medical students, residents, and fellows who are with me who are working on these deep learning problems across not just interoperability that may mentioned, but also applying deep learning and the different problems around structured data, around imaging, around EHR, and other things that we're currently working on. Uh, you know, to Dr. Winslow's point, we have projects working on everything from sex detection to statistical phenotyping uh, to really figuring out how do you make predictions across the entire spectrum of EHR data plus genomics plus tele uh, telemetry data. So if you want to find more information, you can go to this link here or you can email that link. Uh, and more generally, we're also hiring uh, quite heavily. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me at that email address. Thank you. Uh, that's a very dangerous question. Um, I know. I, I think we are, so, so two things. I think we are very interested in building open source platforms. So a lot of my cloud teams are focused on building things on fire, on building.